There we go. All right, good evening. Welcome to um, our monthly peeps at the PEEB um, presentation. Now we have one of our own, Mr. Marty Payne, who is a member of our chapter, and I believe he lives on the Eastern Shore. Um, I'll let him take over in a second. Uh, nothing new to report in terms of chapter business. Obviously, you guys will get the emails. No, we're going to continue doing Zoom for the foreseeable future. Um, our first Monday of the month, uh, first Wednesday of the month, excuse me, um, presentations like this one are called Shot Lunch, the third Wednesday of the month during the day, and then our last Sunday of the month, our baseball babble, um, back and forth. We have a couple uh, cool upcoming guests, obviously people speaking about their books and their presentations and research, and we have Janet Marie Smith next uh, in June, and we also have um, the general manager, why am I blanking on his name, Mr. Graham, um, speaking to us in, in mid-May, um, actually the day after the Everdeen home opener, so he might be a little tired, um, but that's uh, pretty much all I have to say. Um, happy opening day for those who are going tomorrow to Camden Yards or who have been to Washington's. Um, so we'll keep our eye on how this pandemic goes. Um, I've been in touch with Bruce. We're going to look to do a game at Camden Yards later in the season. I'm guessing maybe August, if not September, uh, depending on how um, rules and regulations shake out. And, uh, and there might be a minor league game uh, as well this year. Um, I'm going to go on mute. I hope everybody else goes on mute. And I'll let uh, Mr. Payne take it over. And um, I'll talk to you guys afterwards. Okay, can you hear me all right? Just want to make sure. Okay, good. We're good. All right, well, thanks for um, sitting in for this. Um, I've done some research lately um, on this topic. Uh, Jim Crow plays hardball, and it's really an overview of what uh, I've been able to put together of what it was like to play baseball for African-Americans on, on the Eastern Shore. Um, there are some sort of obstacles, uh, so to speak, in, in doing this. Um, a lot of your information comes from old newspapers, which in a rural area didn't do a lot of coverage of, of African-American activities. Um, of course, that's the same for metropolitan papers. Uh, a lot of times what you would get is very brief. Uh, you get a team name, uh, they're designated as bin colored teams and you get the final score. That's all you get, particularly in the 19th century. You do get some uh, information from accounts that are, um, where baseball is sort of secondary. It, it, it's part of the, uh, uh, a bigger event, maybe, or a, a reportable event. Uh, and we pick up on baseball as a secondary um, part of that. In fact, our first citation that it came across about black teams on the Eastern shore comes in 1875 and that kind of format. Now, certainly they were playing baseball before that, uh, it's just that 1875 was the first citation because, like I said, they weren't real keen on reporting a, a lot. But they, they played for a purse for fun in the brass band. There were a thousand people there for this particular uh, event. And it was really the Colored Oddfellows Convention. And that's what uh, was being reported. Now, I break the research down into pre and post 1930. Um, in the 19th century and up to 1930, your, your primary sources are the rural newspapers in the area. And after 1905, the Afro-American, uh, which um, helps a lot. And then in 1930, you still have your local papers and you still have um, uh, the Afro-American, but you also get some oral history into it. Um, uh, there, there's a lot of guys that, that played, you know, at a certain point in time and, and they've, over the years, they've either, either given interviews or I've been able to speak to them. So found out some things. Uh, African-Americans, we know, were forming businesses and sponsoring teams and promoting things like steamboat excursions over from Baltimore. So it was a very active uh, time. Um, 
despite a lot of the, those obstacles. Um, and by 1900, really every town, enclave, village, hamlet, district, they all had a baseball team or, or at least one. And uh, uh, and that's black or white. And baseball was just a very, um, let me get back. Uh, baseball was a, just a very, uh, uh, it's part of the social fabric of, of the Eastern Shore for, for about 90 years. I, I, I can't stress enough just how important it was in, in every community um, along the way. Uh, and in fact, the Eastern Shore was known as a hotbed of, of baseball activity. Um, uh, by 1900, national papers like the Sporting Sporting News was reporting that, and also major metropolitan newspapers. Now, some of these obstacles I'm talking about, that's actually a term I borrowed from Saul White, um, you know, and his um, early history of, of black baseball. Uh, and, um, you know, he, he made, makes an interesting observation that, a lot of the players of the late 1880s and 1890s that bore the brunt of, of, of Jim Crow were actually um, uh, not born in, in slavery. So it's kind of new to them. It might've been familiar to their parents, but to them, it was a sort of a new occurrence. Uh, so some of those obstacles that came about, uh, one was in Cambridge at the Academy a lot in Cambridge, like I said, um, that was an incident we would find out about baseball because there was a fight over, over use of a baseball field called the Academy a lot. And they, uh, a white team, I guess, went to play or practice and found African-Americans playing. So there was a, what they termed a disagreement. And, but it must've been a little more than that because uh, that night, um, uh, the African-American community formed in the crowd and there were some were reportedly armed with the clubs or staves and uh it was only by the decided actions of a few of uh, uh of the more prominent citizens that uh further trouble was uh, averted they don't um you know, there's no mention of a, of, of a, a sheriff or, or police or anything. Uh, and I don't know what this decided actions meant. I don't just meant they were better armed or, or, or what, but that seemed to uh, end the incident. Uh, another area where baseball is reported as secondary uh, is an incident where uh, a steamboat came over from Baltimore with a team and they played the local Cambridge team. And then uh, uh, it was reported that one of the local girls became enamored with one of the Baltimore players and tried to run off until her mother found out and she stormed the boat and dragged her off. Uh, and that was the reportable incident, not the baseball game. You now there's no box score, there's no game summary. Uh, and a week later, the same boat with the same team came, comes back and the railroad officials wouldn't allow them to play or even uh, even dock the boat. Um, there was, uh, it, it's kind of odd because all the Eastern Shore towns were still courting the uh, tourist dollar just like they do today. Uh, and they were advertising in like the Afro-American about these excursions going to different towns and, uh, you know, and Cambridge actually, uh, Cambridge, um, uh, they um, uh, they actually advertised the Afro American as a vacation destination, which is kind of um, unusual. I mean, they weren't advertising for one day stops; they were advertising for the vacation. But at the same time, they were discouraging these excursions from landing. And through the Jim Crow period, uh, you sense from the newspapers or you can see in the newspapers the, the rising tension, the rising uh, of uh, escalating violence and eventually it leads to lynching. And um, it, it kind of sort of culminates in, a, in an incident in Crisfield where uh, a, a police officer is killed in the line of duty making an arrest and 
so they go out and their gasoline launches, you know, the boats and they uh, they track the guy down up the you know, creeks and, and marshes and they bring him back to uh, Crisfield and then they, they beat him to death in the street, string him up, and then go into uh, the black section of town and actually um, start dragging people out and beating them. Um, at the same time, the people in Onacock, Virginia, which is further south on the eastern shore, they simply ran the whole black population out of town. And Princess Anne, uh, they, they did the same thing. So right around that point, things were really um, difficult you know, for African-Americans to, to be playing ball and to be, to be traveling around. Um, and I, I bring that up because Judy Johnson was growing up right at the epicenter of all of this. Um, Snow Hill was not far away. And his father had been a merchant seaman and knew things weren't that bad everywhere. So in uh, 1907 or so, they moved up the peninsula to Wilmington. And Judy was able to play uh, in a, integrated youth ball. Uh, his father actually coached. And at a certain age, uh, things became segregated again. And um, just as a side note, a fellow Sabre member, uh, Newt Weaver, also a, um, a president of the Wooster Historical Society, um, partnered up with the NAACP and they put a nice monument to Judy Johnson um, in Snow Hill. And um, it's really designed, same design as they used for Buck O'Neill at the uh, uh, Negro League Hall of Fame museum so i don't know if you've seen that but it's a really nice um monument and uh if you're ever down that way ocean city shankatig astig uh, it's probably worth a stop in to take a quick look um around 1905 the um uh, afro-american becomes more a uh active in, in reporting games uh they have what we would might call today an embedded correspondence in the different towns um, around um, the Eastern Shore. And um, they would report on what's going on in the town, but also what was going on with baseball. And they also ran an advertisement consistently, you know, a little block advertisement that said, um, you know, please send us your, your scores. You know, we, we want to see what they are. Um, so so they, they encouraged all of that. Uh, also, by the 1920s, you start to get reports of very few reports, but some of interracial games, uh, one with a class D minor league team, I think one with a high school and then a couple with town teams, which up to that point, I hadn't come across anything like that. Uh, another important uh, development was the formation of the major Negro leagues. And uh, they didn't play as many games as the white major leagues and didn't get paid as much money. So therefore they played more exhibitions. And the Eastern shore was an area that was geographically favorable to that because they were fairly close to Baltimore and Philadelphia and even New York. So a lot of that, um, uh, you know, kind of played into it. So in, in 1924, there's a report of um, exhibition games uh, with the Salisbury Indians, which, which was a class D minor league. And uh, that was played at Maryland Park in Baltimore. And they expected 10,000 uh, for those, those games. Uh, one of the things I, I look for always is is leagues you know the formation of leagues and, and that kind of thing um, and the first one i came across for african-american baseball was the salisbury business league uh, which indicates that it was confined to the town of salisbury um, a lot of times salisbury on the, on the southern shore was like the uh, they call it the hub of the wheel so that when they formed the league salisbury was the center and all the little towns around it you know they would um, join the league so you know princess anne Pocomo, Crisfield, Snow Hill, maybe some towns in um, Delaware would be involved in those leagues, but that doesn't seem to be the case uh, with this. And then in 1925, the Afro-American 
actually reports that Bellevue and Crisfield were part of an Eastern Shore League. Now, to me, that's uh, you know pretty interesting because a lot of leagues formed in a very small area, and it's kind of rare to have what I call a peninsula league. Uh, you know, they're covered from south in Crisfield to further north in, in Bellevue. Um, unfortunately, that's about all I could find on it up to, up to this point. And uh, so, uh, and then in the 1990s, Leon Taylor, who had been a player, was interviewed, and he was very specific that an Eastern Shore League was formed in 1932, a Black Eastern Shore League. And he actually named the teams and, and that kind of thing. But I couldn't find anything in the Afro-American, but I did come across the Bi-State League in 1936, which included some teams from Delaware, but it, it also contained all the teams that Mr. Taylor had been talking about. So it, it was, I'm pretty certain it was the same thing, just being called a different name. And then a couple of years later, that sort of transforms into the Tri-County League. So you have this league sort of in the mid-shore area that's very active. And... Uh, you start to see some of the names in the game reports in the Afro-American, which was up in that up to that point was, you know, just didn't happen. Uh, and some form of this league by some name actually continued into 1979. Uh, so, you know, the leagues were, 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 were active and around. Um, this is a picture of the Bellevue All-Stars uh, from I guess 1930. I'm not real good on dating these, uh, but uh, Bellevue was one of the better uh, independent teams for a lot of years, and they were also a very important member of this Eastern Shore League that Mr. Taylor was talking about. Uh, so, uh, and Bellevue is a small. It was a small African American watermen's community. Uh, and but it, it was very, uh, very influential in, in, in baseball circles. And uh, of course, in the 1980s, it, it was still basically a, a African-American village. And then the seafood industry sort of started to wane and people from different areas discovered, you know, so to speak, the town of Bellevue with all these nice little cottages on the water. And, uh, they've sort of scarfed up. But Bellevue was one of the uh, better teams around. Now, I came across this announcement in 1925, um, sort of unexpectedly uh, at that time. But it, it announces the, a game of the Harrisburg Giants against the Baltimore Black Sox. So you, you were pitting... Oscar Charleston, who's featured in, in, in the ad, uh, you know, the black tie cob of Zara. And then you had Babe Wilson or Judd Wilson uh, from, uh, uh, from Baltimore. And they, they actually played a six game series, uh, two games in Salisbury, two games in Easton and, and two games in Dover. And of course the frustrating thing uh, with this is white newspapers were willing to promote the games, but they never reported them, at least that I could find. Now, there's no box scores. There's no, um, you know, no game summary, not, not even a mention. Uh, so once the game was promoted, that's, that, that's all that mattered. And, uh, and that's about the only really exhibition game I found on the Eastern Shore in the 1920s. There, there could be more, you know, I'm not sure. Um, there, there's kind of a, a break in the action. You just have the, your local teams and that that kind of thing. And then in 1937, the uh, Eastern Shore League, the white class D League, they began to, uh, well, they reformed. And one of the uh, people that uh, took on a franchise was Joe Cambria. Uh, with the Salisbury Indians and Cambria was from Baltimore and he owned Bugle Field and that's where a lot of African-American teams played uh, so he had a connection with 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 the Negro Leagues and um, a lot of the teams in that area 
Uh, Griffith gets a lot of, I, I think used to get a lot of credit for this Cuban connection, but it was actually Cambria. Uh, he went down, he learned of it through the Negro League teams because they were bringing talent up. So he, he started to do say, the same thing with players that were uh, white or could pass for white. So, so he kind of stacked his class D minor league team with a bunch of players that were far, far better than that. And um, so he had a team that was like 25 and one. And the league um, found out he used a, an illegal player, he wasn't Cuban, but he, um, they, forfeited 25 games they were one in 26 and they still won the pennant and uh actually the manager was uh jake flowers was named manager of the year you know there's really a lot of excitement about this team it's still considered one of the top 10 minor league teams of all times uh but cambria was rewarded with a new bylaw uh called the citizen citizenship rule which said that if you weren't a citizen in the united states you couldn't play play baseball and of course, that was subject to appeal to the National Association of Professional Baseball Players. Uh, but um, it, it um, and it's never mentioned in the rule book um, at all, but it's mentioned several times in the newspaper. And actually, there was an incident where a pitcher named Joe Salazar and a catcher named Felix German, who, who did play in the, in the uh, major leagues, uh, just quit the team saying if you're gonna let us play um you know, why aren't you letting everybody else you know so they just went back to cuba so i, I think cambria is, is probably uh, influential if not directly responsible for bringing negro league teams to the eastern shore for these exhibitions and uh, now some of them played in very small towns and you also start reading about uh, at least by the 1920s, that games were being played um, uh, with local black teams that from metropolitan areas that were were pretty good semi-pro aggregations, or they were uh, barnstorming teams and and that type. So these were some of the teams that I found that played on the Eastern Shore from the. Um, uh, from the Negro Leagues. And uh, you can see sort of the basic uh, advertisement, you know, they're, they're promoting the Newark Eagles and the Baltimore Elites, uh, but they're promoting other events, baseball events as well. And um, the truth really didn't always figure into these promotions. There was, there was a game in 1939 uh, the, the Negro Leagues did not have a World Series that year. And uh, there was a team from Baltimore and a team from Philadelphia. And they played a game in Salisbury. And the next game was to be played in the little town of Federalsburg, you know, about a thousand people. And it was being promoted as uh, the championship of the Negro Leagues. Uh, it didn't matter that uh, they were both from the same league. One guy was in third place, and another, another team was in, in fifth place. Uh, you know, none of that really seemed, seemed to matter. Um, and again, the frustrating thing here is uh, not being able to find that box score because these are some of the players, uh, Hall of Fame players, that actually um, uh, were on the rosters at the time that they uh, – you know, played exhibitions on the Eastern Shore, but, you know, I, I can't really document that they did, that there was, uh, you know, just not in the newspapers. I, I've not talked to anybody, you know, oral, orally that, uh, you know, remembers, uh, you know, these games or th this happening. Uh, but, you know, like I said, it, it's frustrating not be able to, to say flat out that, that they played here. You know, I guess sooner or later, um, we might turn up an old scorebook or, uh, you know, a program or something, but I, I don't know if anybody that, that, that's done it yet. Um, oh, this thing wants to jump on me. Um, but that ended in 1941 with the, the 
war anyhow. Uh, but teams remained active in every village, town, ha hamlet, uh, uh, all over the shore. Black and white teams just continued uh, with their activities. Uh, so we know we have at least one league on the northern shore. And I put this picture of the Queen City Tigers because it shows them with two umpires. And that indicates to me one of two things. One is the way they're dressed, they might be a league umpire of some kind, or it, it wasn't unusual for teams to have their own umpires or at least one umpire uh, just to make sure, you know, you, you had one of your own guys on the field. Uh, you know, for a game. Uh, so, yeah, like I said, you know, things are still active. Oops. Uh, and then there was the Oaksville Eagles. And I, I think this is a good example of, uh, of typically how, how things worked in that Oaksville is a very small farming community, 30, 40 families at the time and uh, maybe a general store. They had, um, uh, but these 30 and 40 families would, would get together and raise the money uh, to sponsor a team. And uh, a fellow named uh, Kirkland Hall, uh, Dr. Kirkland Hall uh, played for the, some of those teams. And he was able to trace back through his family that there had, been teams in Oaksville at least since 1910 and probably before, but that's just about as far back as uh, he could trace that through his family. And they actually had teams in, in, in one league or another uh, and, until 1984. Uh, so they not only sponsored the teams, uh, you know, they built the field. They, they raised the money, built the field, you know, scraped it, landscaped it, fence you know, stands uh, and, and did that for, geez, you know, you know, at least 70 years, you know, and probably far, far more than that. And uh, uh, Dr. Hall uh, was actually interviewed recently on a, a podcast called Del Mar of His Own. And uh, Kirkland really attributes a lot of his, you know, success in life to these baseball teams that he played on. Uh, they were, uh, he learned, you know, teamwork, you know, discipline, and he, and he goes on. He says, I don't think I'd have been where I am in life if I hadn't played baseball with these guys. And, uh, you know, and he points out that a lot of the guys he did play with uh, went on to, uh, went on to college, uh, most of them coached, you know, whether at the college level or high school level. And, you know, some were successful in business and that type of thing. And, and he's, I really can't overemphasize how much baseball meant uh, to people on the shore, how much of a social event it was and, and that kind of thing. Um, I included a picture here of the Nanticoke because I, and I think it's about 1950 or so, uh, because they're playing at a field that has a what I would call a significant grandstand. And a lot of the people I've talked to, um, that was a pretty rare event, uh, playing on a field like that. Uh, they always talk about trying to find a level piece of ground and getting it into shape, scraping it, you know, get the infield in shape, fences, you know, stands of what they could afford uh, and, and that type of thing. So that's kind of an, an unusual. Uh, one of the better teams on the upper shore was the Churchill Hawks. Um, and they were part of that Eastern Shore League at one point. And uh, uh, it was uh, a fellow named Ralph Deaton played on that. His father was a sponsor and he owned a beer garden. So out back, you know, they would keep these benches and chairs and tables and that kind of thing. And they would load them up in the pickup every Sunday morning and carry with them to wherever they were playing, whether it was five miles down the road or 50 miles, because they wanted someplace for their, to ensure that their fans uh, could sit. Um, 
And, and then one year, one of the local minor league teams, Class D minor league teams, changed affiliation. So they had these uniforms that Mr. Deaton acquired. And um, uh, the problem was they had Red Sox written across the front. So uh, he said, well, we're just going to have to be the Churchill Red, Red Sox until these uniforms wear out, which, which is what he did. Um, so, it, you know, and, you know, baseball was just so, so important to them. Uh, and like I said, there, there was a Black Eastern Shore League that existed in, until 1979. Um, they were still active when I was you know, moving on to modified softball. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, that's where I met Linwood Baines, you know, Harold's dad, because he was still playing in this league at the time. Uh, and um, he uh, was also playing modified softball. And by that time, a lot of these teams were, you know, had white players, but it was still predominantly a, a, a black league. So, uh, yeah, I think think that's about all I have as far as um, presentation goes. Um, now I don't know if anybody has any questions or anything, but um, I don't know. I don't know if I missed anything. Um, no. Nah. I guess I'm going to do it all pretty quick. So if there's any questions, fine. Um, if not, I don't know where Peter is, but. I'm here. Um, okay. Hey, Marty? <clears throat> yeah, I, I think that's about all I got unless somebody has questions. Yeah, Marty, I was just going to say that I had helped out doing some research on the Negro Major Leagues and the games they were playing and trying to get accounts of the games is difficult. One of the problems was, was that a lot of the black newspapers were weeklies. And so they didn't have the space to put in box scores and, and such. They would sometimes report the games. Oddly enough, the best coverage by a white newspaper I found in Birmingham, Alabama. <laughs> the problem was it used language that we would not want care to hear today. <laughs> And how they described the, the team. I, they did have if, for home games, they would put in uh, complete accounts. Yeah, but the Afro American was very good at covering uh, the Negro major leagues, but they they didn't seem interested in the exhibitions. You know, so, uh, so you know, I, I tried when I found something locally. I I tried to go to the Afro American to see if if they reported the games, and you know. They'll, they'll have box scores for the regular season, like I said, but to have something uh, from an exhibition game, they just kind of let that slide, you know. Yeah, part of the problem was communication. It's not like today, you know, there, it was, imagine, fairly isolated. They're not going to send a reporter out. They're not likely to. And so how do you communicate much back, you know, and it would probably be up to the locals to try to report back on, on things. You know, you're talking about times really where dependent on, on on you know when it came to the rural games and the exhibitions, the or particularly the local games, the Afro American tried. You know, like I said, but they were dependent on other people to send that stuff in. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, after a while, it, it did get better because, like I said, for for most of at least to the 1910s or 20s, you weren't going to find somebody's name in there. Um, at all, um, but they started reporting you know, who was managing the team. You know, if somebody had a good pitching record or somebody hit a lot of home runs and that kind of thing. That would get mentioned in, in the accounts. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and yeah, you, you mentioned that the language some newspaper used. Um, what what I found on the Eastern Shore is, regardless of how small a town was, you would have at a minimum of two newspapers. Um, so a, a town of 2000 would have a, a Democratic paper and a Republican paper. And of course, the Republican paper being the party of Lincoln was more likely to um, cover an African-American activity, you know, whether it's baseball or something else. Uh, 
but um, uh, yeah, it, it's. Um, but then a after a while, you know, the Democratic papers weren't so inclined, uh, and after a while with Jim Crow, everybody gets a little more. Um, most paper, most papers, not all. Most of them get a little more. Um, derogatory, I guess, in, in the reporting of the African American community. Uh, even though you find that there's people serving on, uh, you know, African Americans serving on town councils or commissions and, and things like that, starting up businesses. But uh, yeah, the, the tone by 1890 is significant, significantly different from that of the 1870s. Yeah. Anybody else? So. Anybody else, guys? Any questions? questions? Comments? No. Well, I got some. I got some things here on chat. I don't know what that is. Wait a minute. Now, no, I guess no more questions. Um, No. Guys, anybody before we uh, call it an early evening? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't go any longer. I, I thought I was going to go much longer than that. But uh, as long as you didn't miss anything, we're. we're no, I don't think so. That's why okay. I kind of went back through the slides. I must have missed something, but I guess I didn't. So. All right. All righty. Um, obviously, the next. The call will be on two weeks, which is, I have to look at a calendar, um, the third Wednesday of the month, and that's the 21st for our call shot lunch. Um, that'll be from noon to two. So okay. um, if nobody else has any questions or comments or concerns for Marty or myself. Um, this will probably be up on Sabre's site um, I'm guessing within a few days, uh, Jacob gets them up there pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so anybody going to Oreo's opening day tomorrow? Not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'll be there. there. Yeah, I'll be there. <laughs> All right, I'm there too. So it's gonna be weird, but worth it. <laughs> so, um, so hopefully we'll have a report on how everything went next time around. And um, sure they're going to be working out the bugs for the first homestand. <laughs> uh, I, was so. at the, I was at the Nationals yesterday, and it had a, kind of a feel of a spring training game in that <laughs> it was a sparse crowd. You know, you know, they were vocal and into the game. It's just not, not many, considering that that was the day that they raised the World Series flag. So... Right. That, hmm. It was a beautiful day for a game, though. That was. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, um, keep a lookout for more emails, anything that comes up. Um, those of you who do Facebook, we post stuff there too uh, on our chapter site. And um, we're booked, I think, at least through June to early July for uh, upcoming speakers. So if anybody wants something spot down the line to talk about your book or research or whatever, um, just let me know and hopefully we can get you in. We've become quite popular. So. <laughs> um, and uh, as of now, we know that the National Convention will be next summer in August. So um, we just hope have to hope that the Orioles have home games during those days. So if no other questions, um, I'll let you all get back to your, I see David has a game on right behind him. So we can all get back. Orioles are ahead two to one. Good. Um, after that opening sweep, you know, I didn't figure a sweep in New York, but I, I, I definitely like to take one. So, um, Marty, is there a question? Are you on Facebook? No. No. Okay. No. No. So, um, 
anybody, if you ever need somebody's email address, you can always ask me. Um, and for those of you who use your Saber account regularly, you can log in there and go through the directory and find people's home addresses and, and emails if, if need be. Um, our chapter is doing pretty good. As of today, I think we have over 350 folks on our roster. We're not as big as DC by any means, but we're in the top six or seven um, in all of Saber. And um, for a chapter that hasn't been, it's not even six years old yet, we're doing pretty darn good. And we're getting thumbs up uh, out of Phoenix. So now we just got to put on a heck of a convention. Um, and hopefully I'll see all of you there. Uh, I think most, most of you guys are local, so. Um, hey, you're gonna make, make us volunteer. Of course we'll be there. <laughs> well, those of you who are really looking, you wanna volunteer, yeah, so. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Those of us who are officers in, in the uh, local chapter are, are gonna be uh, indentured servants for a few days too, and we still have to pay, so, you know, same thing. <laughs> um, the only thing for me that'll be good is my wife and I are moving um, a little over a month. We're moving to Federal Hill, in downtown Baltimore. So I'll actually be about 10 blocks from the hotel. So um, it'll be a much easier commute for me back and forth. <laughs> it'll be down, downhill too. Yeah, it's laid downhill. So and <laughs> no, I'm not gonna give you all my address so you can't show up and and, uh, <laughs> and rummage through. So um, there'll be enough attractions. I don't have to open, open you to my man gate. So um, I guess that's it. I'm glad we had, we had a good crowd tonight. I think we had 11 or 12 max. So um, I'm pleased. I know pandemic and people are zoomed out. I think um, people forget about it since, we, since the first announcement. I, I'm sure some people have forgotten about it. Yeah, I should send these more often, but some people are complaining about getting too many emails. Yep, so that's, that's why true. I kind of- yep. No, I agree with that too, yeah. Yeah, you can you consolidate a little more. So um, I try to send at least one a month with updated schedules. Um, Always, for those of you who know the Saber calendar, there's always, you can go to the, the National Saber website calendar and should, you can be able to find our, our stuff in there. And um, I encourage you to go to the other chapters, uh, meetings and chats and stuff too. I've done DC, I've done Philly, I've done Chicago, Houston, and a couple others to just hear certain speakers and just get a, a variety of flavors. So, um, you know, this pandemic has done one good thing is it's brought us sports fans at least a little bit closer together. So, um, and the Pee Wee Reach chapter, actually I spoke there last uh, Saturday to them. Um, so they're, they're small, but they're very, they're getting more active. So um, there's lots of little gems out there. Think outside the box. Um, and what's up with the Phillies? I can't believe they're actually like winning. I, I don't, um, um, yeah, I know. It'll be the, the May Foles versus the September Foles. Um, but uh, that's it for me. If nobody else has anything, I'm going to uh, shut down. Thanks, Frank, Theodore, and Meg, Bruce. We've got a bunch of everybody here. So um, much appreciated. And uh, I don't see you guys beforehand. But well, Jeff, I'll probably see you tomorrow at the game. Oh, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm one room from my, in front of my regular seat. Okay. So you'll be able to find me. Yeah, I know point. where you are. Yeah. So um, we will. Um, you know, reconvene in two weeks and um thanks everybody for coming and thanks for supporting saber and uh stay healthy stay well i get round two of my vaccine on saturday so hopefully the rest of you are somewhere in line and, and, and getting everything done so, uh, hope everybody who celebrated had a good easter and we'll see you in a couple of weeks okay all right guys good night, all right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.